right, so one of the things that is the largest challenge for us in our practice is actually people making the wrong decision after they hurt themselves about what to do about their injury. And it's really called basic injury management. We all do it, we all hurt ourselves. And so we have to understand why uh, we hurt ourselves, but what's actually happening underneath when we hurt ourselves and what are we supposed to do about it? And that's really basic injury management. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. And, and the first thing that we have to do is sort of understand that the body's intelligent. You know, with, with every perspective, you have to start from, um, I guess, a philosophy of where you're gonna start from. And you could assume that the body is inherently flawed and, and breaking down and needs support, or you can assume that it's doing things that are somewhat intelligent. And, that, and that's where we're starting from. And so we have to have faith in our body and we wanna support our body as opposed to constantly overriding our body, if that makes sense. And so as you're looking at what your reaction is to uh, an injury, when I'm talking about this type of stuff, this is where that's coming from. It's really coming from a place of your body's functioning all the time, you know, a sperm and an egg come together, nine months later you have a baby, and, and you didn't really do anything to create that baby, right? Uh, the baby develops, and, uh, and then when the baby's born, all of a sudden it isn't helpless, right? It has, it has the ability to grow and develop into a human being, and it just keeps going. And what we need throughout our lifetime is support, to that natural development, and that's really what we in chiropractic call development care. So this is part of that, is that idea that if you make the right decisions, you have a lot less pain and suffering than if you make the wrong decisions. And so the take home message, and this is really, I wanna keep it very simple. If something is sharp, use cold, and if something is dull or tight, use heat. It's a pretty much universal rule. It, it, it's not 100%, but it's very, very much so. If you use cold with sharp and dull heat, uh, dull, you use heat, um, then you're gonna be usually in pretty good shape. And, and why might that be? It's because when things tear, they sting. There's a grading system in uh, in injuries and there's a three grade system and we're going to make it a four grade system because we're going to introduce the grade zero and hopefully with the four grade system zero one two and three you're going to kind of understand this so when i was playing soccer a couple of years ago and i was running down the field and somebody slid in front of me and stopped me from running and i pitched forward and landed on my shoulder and there was a there was a ligament here that is supposed to hold my shoulder to the body that couldn't hold the load, and so it tore. And how much it tears tells you about the grade. Mine happened to be a grade three, which would be a complete tear, right? So it tore fully, and so my shoulder was basically down here, and my collarbone was up here. So that wasn't an ideal scenario, and so that's a, that's a full tear. So there's certain things that you need to do with that. Um, but a grade two, if you hear about a grade two, it's a partial tear, it's about 50%, and a, and a grade one, somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 50% of the fibers are torn. And then below that is the grade zero, where you've hurt something, you've damaged something, but it really hasn't torn it enough to really negatively impact its integrity. Does that make sense to everybody? And so that's the first thing we want to know about. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hand out these pieces of paper to everybody, and I'll, I'll just give this to you. And we're going to, we're going to teach you grade zero, grade one, grade two and grade three. Once everybody has it, and maybe Jocelyn can have one too. She can be a part of this. I don't know if you know this. Yeah. You do? Okay. So what I want you to do is take your piece of paper in your hand and I want you to just shake it up really hard. Just shake it, shake it really hard. Uh -oh. Okay. <laughs> Now, if you, if you shook it appropriately, you might not have created a grade three, but, you know, what you have here, just look at your paper, you know, it's not a beautiful piece of paper anymore, right? And, and so there's little kinks in it. And so if you took a microscope and looked at that, you could imagine what that paper's made of has had little micro tears in it, right? That's a grade zero. So let's say you're out, you're gardening, you're, you're um, the next day you wake up and you're a little sore, the day after that, you wake up and you're more sore. That, that kind of thing. I mean, in Calgary today, people are probably really sore from cleaning up after the floods. That's why 
you know, people, people are gonna be sore and so they don't know what to do. And so if you do that, you really haven't caused a lot of damage to the paper. It's really a usable piece of paper. You might not know what, write anything really important on it, right? But um, you might be able to iron it out, you know? And so what would you use for that? Then heat, right? If you're gonna iron out the piece of paper, you would use heat. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So now, now take the piece of paper and just crumple it up into a big ball. All right, now open it up again. Okay, so now the piece of paper has a lot more damage to it. Is that right? And yet, it still has its integrity, right? It's not a lot weaker than what it was before. You can still shake it and it shouldn't tear, right? But it has the same integrity. That's a grade one. So if you ever hear of somebody who had a sprain or a strain, a sprain is of a, a ligament and a strain is of a muscle. They're, they're terms that are used like that. But a grade one is this. There's damage to the ligament or the, or the, or the tendon, but it's such that you really have full integrity. You just have to be a little careful with it for a short period of time and, and you're gonna heal very nicely, right? It hasn't really even stretched very much. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now if we take that same piece of paper now and you just tear it halfway down the center. Right? Grade two. So this is a grade two. Now, do you think this ligament is as strong as the previous ligament or the or the paper that you had prior to doing this stuff to it, it isn't. So it's, it's compromised and yet you might do that to your shoulder, right? People have rotator cuff injuries all the time and they have grade two sprains of their rotator cuff or grade two strains of the rotator cuff tendons. And so when they move, they can't really move very well, right? And if you think about cutting your skin, you'll have a scab on there, right? And so that's what's gonna form fairly quickly because the body's intelligent, right? And it puts, stuff down and so it's going to do that and so what you want to do with that is you want to make sure you don't tear it anymore don't peel the scab right mm -hmm. but as it heals one of the things that happens is the 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 healing tissue which is collagen in your body it comes in and it and it splats down in all sorts of directions it's not just straight right whereas the the tissue that was there previously was going in the line of the forced load of that tendon or ligament. They, they were really lined up. And then when you tear it, then you splat some stuff down, like if you glued that, right? You can imagine it's all going in different, different directions, right? And so what you want to do is you want that tendon now to heal so that the, line, the, the fibers line up again. And so that's where you might have us tell you, walk your hand up and down the wall, right? So that you, you can do that without being too stressful on it but yet you can, uh, you can make sure that the, the ligament itself or the tendon has mobility and, and has some motion so that it doesn't get stuck, right? And it's gonna open that up and it's gonna tell that tissue what direction you're gonna wanna use it in and the ones you're loading through there are gonna stick around and the ones that you're not using are gonna go away and be resorbed by your body because your body's intelligent. Right? And that's really, it's a really critical thing to remember. So does that help everybody with the grade one, two, and three? Does that make some sense? Okay, wonderful. So we'll just move on a little bit. So here we are with our summary of grade zero, one, twos, and threes. Now, I really would like you guys to just intuitively understand this. As you can make notes, you can also watch it back. But what my most important piece is, is the understanding of this. So now, if you take that piece of paper and you just shake it around, how are you gonna get it straightened out again? Are you gonna mm -hmm. iron it? Yeah. So you're gonna use heat on that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's probably, if you've ever done that, you, have you ever gardened and then the next day, things are really tight or you play a sport that you're not used to? You know, it's an ache and a tension, right? And so what we have there is we have the need for heat. Right, so heat is very safe to use in that circumstance. A grade one, what have we done with a grade one? We've, we've torn a few more fibers in there, right? We've really kind of damaged it. So if it's a sharp pain, we didn't have a lot of inflammation associated, but if it's a sharp pain, what are you gonna use for that? Cold or heat? Sharp. Cold. Cold, right? Because sharp things tear, right? And they stay. 
And so you're gonna use cold with that, okay? Okay, and then if it isn't that, if it's just an achy thing, but it's a little bit more damaged, maybe a couple days later, it's not as sharp anymore, but it's dull, then it's safe to use heat, right? And then when you get into a grade two, now you have damage to the thing, right? To the ligament or the tendon. And so are you gonna use cold or are you gonna use heat for that? Cold. cold. And then you see omega-3s and tape in there. Now, if you tore that piece of paper and you taped it back up, it would be more secure than if you just left it torn, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where when I, when I tore my shoulder, the first thing I did was I called here, I asked, the people here to call an athletic therapist and see who was open. And I asked somebody to drive me to them and I asked them to tape my shoulder. Because once they taped it, and they taped it within an hour, so it was an acute injury, it got taped immediately. I didn't go sit in emergency for 10 hours, right? Because I knew that wouldn't work. So I immediately went, had it taped, and it was fully torn, but my shoulder and that injury should have required surgery, but because of fast action and understanding it, it didn't need surgery and it healed pretty much completely. I mean, it never heals completely. You know, soft tissue when, they, when it's torn, I have this cut on my wrist that I use sometimes to give an example of this. When I was 10, I flew over the handlebars of my bike and landed on a piece of glass and really cut my wrist very badly. And if you look at my wrist, you'll see exactly where that cut is. And, and so that's 30 years ago, and yet there's the cut. And so you have to understand, when you really hurt yourself and you tear things, it's estimated that it's gonna to yield to about 70% of what it was before that, mm -hmm. right? And so it's really important not to re-injure it in that healing time. Mm -hmm. Because if you re-injure it, now it's harder for it to heal. And it needs to keep putting more stuff on. And remember your body, once this stuff splats on there to try to heal the area and tape it, mm -hmm. right, internally, mm -hmm. then it needs to remember, it's gotta get the fibers lining up again. So that takes time for that healing to happen before it's strong again. And if you tear it, then it's gonna splat stuff again down. And you can imagine how, how that takes longer and longer to heal if you're putting more of that putty on it, basically. Is that, that's what your body's doing to these re-injuries. Does that make sense to everybody? So I, I hope you can picture that. So with the tape of a grade two, you can still use it, right? Like remember your arm up and down, but maybe a little bit of tape on it is gonna help you so that it has enough support so that it's not really under a lot of stress, just like the piece of paper. And then when you think about a grade three, what you really have to do when the tendon or when the, the tendon or the, um, the ligament mostly is, is, is torn fully, then you have to immobilize it. So what I did was I sat on the couch with a pillow under my elbow, with my feet out in front of me, with an ice pack on my shoulder for a week. I really didn't do anything else. I just sat there, right? And, and, it, and it's because I know that it needs to be approximated so that it can get that on there and it can create a good enough scab so that it's strong enough so that I can start doing things with it to take it through normal ranges of motion. And what I did was then I went into a pool and I started moving it through ranges of motion because then my weight wasn't fully holding it, right? And I would get underwater and I would move it as much as I could in a pain-free range of motion. And so then it told the, that tissue where I was using that and it could know, keep these ones, keep depositing tissue in this line, but leave the other ones, get rid of that stuff, right? Does that, does that all make sense? So that's how we do it. Now when you injure your back, often it's not a grade three. And in fact, most often it's not a grade two. Usually it's a grade one, okay? Mm -hmm but it can be a grade two. And so that's where you can really differentiate whether you use heat or cold on your back based on what? Sharp, sharp dull. dull. It's, it's a really, I think it's a really nice system, right? To, to sort of know that. Okay, so this is what you have to understand about cell repair and damage 101 to kind of understand why you would use cold, okay? And, um, and so, Let's say I'm running along and, I, and, I, and I, I'm on an uneven surface and I'm jogging and then I step on something and I twist my ankle, right? So my ankle twists. And so then inflammation happens, right? You can imagine. Now, if you had a grade one, it would just be kind of a little bit of inflammation. If it was a grade two, it would probably be a, um, like a golf ball on the side of my ankle. 
okay? And if it was a grade three, you'd probably see a lot of inflammation and a lot of blood, right? Underneath, it'd be big bruising, right? Does that, does that fit for everybody? Can you kind of picture these things? You've all probably seen them. But those are the gradings. And so what you want to understand is that the body is bringing inflammation to that area to do what? To splint, to splint the ankle, right? Because if it gets a lot of inflammation, then there's not as much mobility. And if I don't have as much mobility, then what happens? It's going to heal better, right? Because it's this tape and the support. It's, it's a natural form of that, right? Does that make sense? So if I do a little bit of a tear, like a grade one, then I'm going to have a little bit of inflammation. If I do a bigger tear, then I have more inflammation. If I do a bigger tear, then I have more inflammation. Because again, the body's intelligent. It's responding appropriately to the level of the damage that's there. And so part of our challenge sometimes is we hurt ourselves. And then what we need to do is we need to get back to work or play or whatever we're doing in our lives. We have to get back to it really quickly. And, and that's a demand of modern society, really. It, it really is. And, and the challenge is that sometimes, let's say I reduce the inflammation, I take lots of Advil, right, to reduce the inflammation, and I put lots of cold on it to reduce the inflammation. And then I go out and I think, oh, that's not so bad. And I go for a jog too early again, right? Now I'm gonna develop into a chronic condition. And that's what a lot of people have, is they have ankles that twist and then they retwist and they retwist because they never actually allowed them to heal properly in the first place. So when you're thinking about how you're gonna to respond to your basic injury, also consider that. Let's make sure we really heal fully from these injuries before we put ourselves through it again. But in truth, the demands of life will sometimes say, you can't do that. You know, if JP hurts himself, how many days can he take off? right, before it really adversely affects his potential lifestyle, right? Like, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult thing to try to figure out. It's not like we live in a, in, a, in a society necessarily where we could just take a month off and he could put his feet up on the couch when he twists his ankle, right? So we wanna understand that and we wanna try to find a balance that works for us. But if we're short-circuiting the process and we don't even know we're short-circuiting the process, we have a bigger problem than if we're short-circuiting it and we understand it, okay? So here's what happens. The inflammation comes in and cells need what to survive? They need what nutrient to survive, do you think? Oxygen. Oxygen, right. And so what carries oxygen to the cells? Blood. Blood, right? Now, if there's a lot of inflammation and blood can't get into the cell, then is the cell more or less likely to die than if it's getting proper nutrient? It's gonna die. And then if it dies, then what do cells do when they die? Do you guys know what cells do when they die? Yeah, they explode, right? So cells die by exploding, you know? I mean, it'd be weird if we all did that, but all of our cells, that's how, that's how they die. It'd be a lot easier for materials, but uh, they just explode when they're done, right? And if they explode, then they contain fluid and then they add inflammation, right? So part of what we want to do with the cold is we want to reduce the oxygen needs of the cells. You guys have heard of cryogenesis, maybe the, the idea that somebody thinks, oh, maybe someday they'll come up with a cure for my disease, so I'm going to cool my body and keep it in this preserved, semi-preserved state until someday we figure out what's going on, and then they'll bring me back to life, right? Hmm. You've kind of heard, maybe heard of that. You know, it's, it's kind of a funny thought, but... But the idea there is that if you slow things enough, you know, if, if somebody is, um, is overheating versus if somebody is overcooling, right, hyperthermia versus hypothermia, mm -hmm. you're much more likely to survive in hypothermia, so cool, than in hyperthermia, right? Because if you're in hyperthermia, all of your cells need more oxygen to survive and they die faster. So that's something that we have to understand about why to use cold. And that's why whenever you ask us, we say, you know, if you're in, in at any way in doubt, use cold, because cold won't hurt you, right? Okay. Cold will never hurt you, but heat, if you increase the metabolic needs of the cells and they can't get blood to them, more cells are gonna die, it's gonna create more inflammation and more damage to your original damage. So one of the things we wanna do is when we've hurt ourselves, we wanna limit the damage that's caused after the original injury. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. is, this, is this fitting for everybody? Is this level kind of uh, the right level? Okay. 
So in our practice, we'll talk about cold. We'll talk about omega-3s. Now many people are confused about omega-3s as well, and I just want to sort of let everybody understand what they are. Um, in nutrition, there are things called essential nutrients. And there's certain essential amino acids, and there's certain essential fatty acids. And some people think there are certain essential uh, carbohydrates. And, um, and that's, that's less clear because the only essential carbohydrates are patented. So we're not 100% sure if that's true. So um, we, we do know, however, for sure, that there are essential fatty acids and essential amino acids. Okay, that's been long known. And what essential means in nutrition, when you hear the term essential, what it means is your body can't make it. It can't make it from anything else. And so what's interesting in the body is people might not understand these nutrients come in, there's protein, like animal um, meat would have protein in it, right? It'd have a large amount of protein. There's fat, right? And animal meat would also have potentially a larger amount of fat, depending, right? And then there's carbohydrates. And, you know, everything from rice to potatoes to lettuce to corn has larger amounts of carbohydrates. And all your foods have a combination of one of those three basic food groups. Protein, carbohydrates, or fat. And what's what happens in your body is your body can take any of those and make them into another one. So it can take a fat and make it a carbohydrate if it needs to. It can take a protein and make it a carbohydrate. That's why with weight loss, if you don't bring in enough protein to your system as you're losing weight, your body steals the protein, makes it carbohydrates, and burns it. Right? And then you lose your lean muscle mass because you've stopped eating. Right? So that's important. Those are topics that we've gone over in the past, but it's important that we put this all together. So essential amino acids are things that your body can't get from anywhere else. Essential fatty acids are things that your body can't get from anywhere else either, except for intaking them directly. And so the essential fatty acids are called omega-3s and omega-6s. And omega-3s, all omega means in biochemistry is where the first double bond on a carbon chain is. So if you remember back, if any of you took chemistry, there's all these carbons in a row, right? And there's bonds between them. And sometimes there's two bonds, a double bond, and sometimes there's three bonds, a triple bond, right? So if you count three back on a fatty chain, right, it ends in a certain carbon, oxygen, hydrogen type thing. Sorry to get deep here, right? <laughs> but you go three back in the carbons, and that's where your first double bond is? That's called an omega-3. And if it's all single bonds until the sixth carbon, then it's called an omega-6. And if it's all single bonds until the ninth carbon, it's called an omega-9. That's where the word comes from, right? Most people have no idea. And so when you deal with that, then you start to understand, okay, so that's what it is. And so now an omega-3 is anti-inflammatory, and an omega-6 is pro-inflammatory, okay? So sometimes I'll say to people, why don't you take an omega-3? And they'll say, oh yeah, I have some in my cupboard. And so they start taking an omega-369. And what we're trying to do is get them anti-inflammatory, but what do they do? They take a 369, and sixes are what? Pro-inflammatory. Right. So then we have an issue, right? So we're increasing inflammation, and we're trying to decrease. So as we talk about it, we always talk about the omega-6 is kind of be the accelerator of inflammation. And is inflammation all bad? No. It's not. It's needed, right, at certain times. But the challenge in our society is that our diet allows us to have kind of a approximately a 20 to 30 to 1 omega-6 to 3 intake in our diet. And that becomes a real problem, right? Because too little water, you dehydrate, right? And too much water is called drowning, right? If you take in too much. So everything's about balance, you know? And so what we need is we need the right combination of accelerating and braking when you drive a car to not get in a car accident. And the same in your body. You need the right amount of omega-3s and 6s. So there's tests we can send people for to see how much omega-3s they have and see if it's appropriate and see the ratios. But you've got to understand, if you eat a really normal diet in North America, you're probably going to be deficient in omega-3s. Just like if you live in Canada at Calgary's latitude, mm -hmm. you're probably deficient in vitamin what? Mm -hmm. D. Yeah, so we kind of know that. So we can supplement with it, and it's okay because it's not very toxic for us. And so we can take some, and we're, and we're going to be safe with that. And so omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. They're the things that your body makes its own natural anti-inflammatories out of. And omega-6s are the ones that it makes its pro-inflammatories out of. So that's really important to know. And then again, cold reduces metabolism. Now, 
Metabolism is a big word. People may or may not understand what that is, but metabolism is just your energy needs. So if I say, what is your metabolism? It's how many calories you spend to exist. Your, what's your basic metabolism? Basal metabolism is the amount that your body spends to exist doing nothing, right? So if you just sit on a couch all day and hang out, somebody feeds you through a tube, then you could calculate your basic metabolism in calories. And if you got up to walk around, that would add energy expenditure, so you'd spend more energy, and so your metabolism would increase. And that's why when they say, you gotta increase your metabolism by exercising in the morning, right? You get things going in the morning, and then everything's running at a higher rate all day long, right? So it's spending more energy all day. If you exercise in the evening, it's still great, but now you're spending all this energy, now you're trying to go to sleep, right? So it doesn't always work too well together. If anybody's ever played sports late at night, they know what I mean. So. Um, that's the idea with metabolism. So metabolism is just the amount of energy you spend or what you require to sustain yourself, right? Starvation is having less energy in or food in than you require to exist, right? And there's a lot of diets out there that are just starvation diets. They're like, your metabolism is 2,500 kilocalories and we're gonna give you 12. And guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna eat your protein, you're gonna turn it to sugar, and you're going to spend it to walk around, right? And so you, it's, it's kind of a funny thing. And then if you eat all your lean muscle mass, when you start eating again, guess what you put back on? Fat. But then your lean muscle mass is down, so your metabolism is down, right? And now it's a, it's a really bad cycle. So that's what happens for a lot of people. And um, unfortunately, those diets still exist, but people are becoming more aware of them. And they've tried them, and they didn't work for them. And so they're starting to understand that you can't do it that way. So, heat's gonna increase the blood flow, okay? And it's gonna increase your metabolism. So what's the metabolism? It's the energy needs of the cell. And what happens when a cell is blocked off from nutrients, but you increase its energy needs? It dies. And when it dies, it, and then it adds to inflammation. Yeah, you guys have it down. This is perfect. And this is what I call the one hour mistake, because this happens all the time. Somebody hurts themselves, it's a sharp pain, right? And what should you use? Cold. Cold. Okay, so you got a sharp pain and you put heat on it and guess what it feels? Better. It feels better. So it confuses you, you think that feels better and if it feels better, it must be good, right? <laughs> but it's not always good when it feels better because what happens then an hour later is it's way worse than it ever would have been but you don't maybe know that and so you put more heat on it and then it feels better. And then an hour later, it's even worse. And the next day you get out of bed and you can't move. Whereas if you just put cold on it, you would have gotten out of bed, rolled out and walked around, no problem. Okay, so don't make that one hour mistake with heat. If it's sharp, if it's an acute injury, if you think you've torn something, if it grabbed you, right? If it's loose feeling, <laughs> don't use heat, use ice. Does that mm -hmm. fit for everybody? Okay. How does inflammation prevent the blood from getting to the tissue? The inflammation comes in, right? So the tissue swells, and then the blood vessels can't bring, can't bring um, blood oxygen. to the cells anymore because it's blocked off. It's like if I took your finger and I just grabbed it and squeezed it, you would stop the blood flow from going through there. So it's pressure, right? If I put a pressure cuff on your arm, this big manometer, right? And squeezed it, you're, you, you would stop the blood flow properly to that. So that's, it's the same kind of a concept. Because the cells are so full. They're right. swollen, as it were. Yeah, well, they're, the, it's not necessarily the cells. It could be the, what's called the interstitium, which is the area between the cells. Because there's area between the cells that stuff comes into, okay. right? Blood could come into there, fluid could come into there, right? All the other cells that died released all of their contents into the interstitium, and now it's not contained anymore under pressure, so it's open, so it creates pressure outside. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. That's a great question though, thank you for that. Okay, so does this, when, I, when you read this, what I want it to do is make complete sense to you right now, right? So we've got, it's numbing the pain, so if you put something and you, you cool it, it's gonna numb the pain, which is very nice if you're in pain. To, to sort of block that, it's a good use. It slows the metabolism, 
right? So it means it needs less energy, so it's gonna be more likely to survive. And then the only thing you have to be careful of is frostbite. And this is, this is the only thing that people do wrong with cold. So what they do is they'll take something cold and they'll put it on their skin. And it shouldn't probably be directly on your skin, but they'll take something cold and they'll put it on their skin. And whatever they put on there is gonna to start to warm up now because it's out of the freezer, right? Mm. So it's warming up and it's transferring cold into your hand and it's, and it's transferring warmth from your hand to the cold, right? And so we're doing a transfer here. So this cold pack is warming up and my hand is cooling down, okay? Now, if I warm up the cold pack, it gets fully warm. Has everybody known that? Like it's just now it's not cold anymore. And I take it off and I, I, I go grab another one and I put it on there. Now it's gonna get really cold, right? And then you're gonna frostbite yourself. And that's why when people are asked, how long should I use cold for and how long should I take it off for? The real answer is when your body temperature, when your skin temperature gets up to room temperature again, or normal body temperature, sorry, then you put the cold on again, hmm. right? But if you want a timeline, that's usually really safe to do 20 minutes on and 40 minutes off. So each hour, 20 minutes on, 40 minutes off is really safe. And you could cut that closer depending on the warmth of the environment you're in. Obviously, it will warm up faster, right? So, but the real answer is you just want the skin temperature to get back to normal before you put cold on again and you won't have any frostbite. So what happened to the weekend warrior, the person who's out doing too many push-ups or dancing, right? And that's really what happens is you start using these muscles and these muscles that you haven't used now break down and they start, they start having a little bit of breakdown. Kind of like when you shook up that piece of paper and maybe if you were crazy enough about it, maybe it's like you crumpled up the piece of paper. But for both of those, unless it's sharp, you're safe to use what? Heat. Heat, that's right. Okay, and so just, this is just a myth that people will propagate a little bit. They'll say, what, what causes pain in the muscles? They'll say it's lactic acid. And the truth is that lactic acid is flushed out of your muscles relatively quickly. It does create a problem to continue exercising, but it's flushed out. It's not what creates pain. What creates pain is the micro damage to the tissue, right? And so anybody who is our patient, we're always talking to them about first tension stretching. We're saying, you can't stretch every day if you stretch really hard. You have to stretch gently. Because if you stretch hard, you break down the muscles. You know, my 11-year-old is in gymnastics. Um, she's, she's fairly talented in it. She's given it up now, which makes me kind of happy because it's very injury producing. But she was there and the coach was on her and pushing her chest to her knees, right? And that's how they stretch these kids, to stretch them. And if they do it a few times a week, then the body will be able to heal enough in between that you'll be okay. Right? Mm -hmm. But you're getting micro tears there. But if you do it every day, you can create a really big issue in those muscles, right? So you have to kind of understand what you're doing there. And so even a night out dancing or cleaning up after the flood that we've had or gardening too much in the spring, we see it all the time, right? Or you decide you've never hiked before, but you're gonna go to the top of Yamnuska, <laughs> right? It's, it's these types of decisions that we make, our bodies now have to cash that check. And so we need to understand what's happening. And it's actually just damage to the tissue. And so what heals tissue? Blood, right? blood heals tissue and so when you get the blood to the tissue then you're going to be able to uh, heal that tissue and heat brings more blood to the tissue and so as long as there's not too much inflammation in the tissue heat is safe to use yes and is that why exercising in another day or two actually helps right because it brings blood into that tissue perfect that's okay. great that's exactly right other questions does that make sense and so that's where the benefits of stretching come in. And this is a piece that I really want to express here because it's so important. There's a few different things. So um, the first thing is that when you stretch, you squish your tissue, right? And squishing tissue squishes venous blood out of it right? and allows for arterial blood or fresh blood to come back into it. And so stretching every day allows for a turnover of fluid in your tissue. And that's why we suggest to our patients in the initial eight weeks that they stretch twice a day and after that once a day because we're really squishing everything out and getting new fresh blood in and we want the tissue to remodel and heal to support you in the appropriate postural position, right? 
The other piece that you want to understand is that a cold muscle, and you've probably felt this yourself, a cold muscle isn't as flexible. Uh, you know, the person who injures their ankle, typically they injure it at the end of the basketball game, not the beginning of the basketball game. Because the ability of a ligament to hold a load is inversely proportional to the amount of heat. What that means is the longer and the warmer something is, then it's actually weaker, right? And so with stretching, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you are bringing into your muscle a little bit of flexibility, but you want to do that relatively gently. And that's why with static stretching, we recommend first tension stretching. So the type of stretching that we want to do is the type of stretching where you are just finding the first tension and you're just holding it until it relaxes. You're not pushing beyond that. If you're going to get ready for an athletic event or you're going to go play golf or you're going to go and, um, and go for a hike, you don't want to do static stretching before necessarily. You want to do something called dynamic stretching, which is just moving your body around and getting the, everything moving so that you can get blood flow to the, to the muscle and warm it up, right, so that it's ready. And then after you're done, that's when it's best to do static stretching. But many people, they static stretch too hard and then they just tear the muscles, right? So we want to be careful about that. And so the muscle that's cold, it doesn't bounce as well, right? It doesn't have as much flexibility. If anybody has ever used a slingshot, anybody ever use a slingshot? Mm -hmm. So what happens is a muscle always crosses a joint. And a muscle is what allows us not only to stand up, right? Paraplegics and quadriplegics can't stand up because they don't have muscle tension, right? People with CP can't move properly because they have too much muscle tension. So you need the right amount of muscle tension. And so what we, what we want is we want the muscle to be able to contract to allow us to move. So for me to step, I have to contract my calf muscle, for instance, okay? But as I'm walking, I'm stretching and contracting, stretching and contracting. Can we kind of picture that? Now, if I stretch the muscle and there's an elastic component to the muscle, it's kind of like a slingshot. I get to the end and I get a bounce rebound, right? And if I get a bounce rebound, I get something called momentum. And so momentum is motion, right? It's a certain speed. And what we're doing there with that is then we're not needing to fully contract all the time, right? We don't have to contract fully because we actually have some that's just happening from motion, right? And that makes for a very efficient then walking gait. Does that make sense? So if you're not stretching and your muscles are really tight, then every time you move anything, your muscles have to claw their way up there. Whereas if you're stretching and your muscles are nice and loose and bouncy, then there's going to be a bounce that gives it momentum and then it just has to kind of get the rest of the way. It's kind of like the difference between walking to this wall and me trying to climb up it and see how high I could get versus me going over here and running to the wall and seeing how high I could get. We know that when I'm running to the wall, I'm going to get higher up that wall than if I just sort of try to walk up the wall, right? And so for our patients, what we really want is for them to have that bounce back in their muscles that can support them so their muscles don't have to work as hard so that their muscles don't pull them out of alignment especially in early time because with the muscles not supporting them in their new postural position that we've brought them to they have a higher likelihood of being pulled back out into a wrong position over the first year of care in our office right does this all kind of fit for you guys is this making some sense good and so there's a couple of different things that you might see on our shelves that, that you might wonder, what are these things? So Pro Omega, again, we're looking for a pure Omega-3. And we want a brand that we know is third-party independent, tested, and reputable. And we know that we're getting what we think we're getting. So um, that's what we have there. Another thing there is BioFreeze. Now, we recommend ice. We, we, we much prefer ice. You could use a bag of peas. You could use ice. But the problem is if you're sitting at your office desk, you can't always have a bag of peas or ice cycling on your back. So we have something called BioFreeze, which is a gel that cools. And so it creates cold and it's, it's quite helpful. And then the other thing that's there is obviously an ice pack. And then lastly is Orthoflex. Now Orthoflex is a heat. It's a heat rub. It's a similar type of thing to, uh, it's a similar type of thing to getting warmed up, right? You can rub yourself, you can, but if you put some warm rub on it, it'll bring blood flow to the muscles and warm you up. So if you don't think you have enough time to warm up, like if it's a cold day and I'm about to play soccer, Orthoflex is perfect for me to put on my muscles because then it's gonna warm up and it's gonna reduce the likelihood of me having an injury because the warmer the muscle, the more bounce in the muscle, the more bounce in the muscle, the more responsiveness 
right? And the more efficient the muscle. Does that work for everybody? Okay. So that's what I have. I think that um, I think that we we maybe learned a little bit about um, basic injury management here, and uh, and I hope everybody's enjoyed themselves. So thank you. Very